All right, we're going to get started. Uh, once again, thank you for being here. I uh, just want to say this has been incredible, an incredible first day, uh, and I just see so many warm faces. And coming from Indiana up here, I can honestly say that Bob and Doug McKenzie did not represent you guys. <laughs> no way. No way. Take off, eh? You hoser. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, like uh, Rob and I went across the lake. Yeah. Right? Yeah, eh? Yeah, eh? Uh, and... Uh, we went across the lake and proved that Chicago was right there. There was no mirage. And the mirage was nothing but uh, lensing, right? Correct. Correct. Okay. Let me go back to me. <clears throat> All right, I'm back. Now, what happened was with me is uh, Rob and I were working on seed. And um, I'm not going to, like, make you run up the steps. <laughs> You're already up here. Um, we were working on seed together. I'd sent him an audition tape, and I, had done, I did radio for years and did all kinds of stuff and kooky stuff and, like I said earlier, class clown stuff. But Rob and I clicked right away. And uh, seed came second nature for us. It was just like, boom, we just started working on it. And this friendship developed. I'd already seen a lot of his work. So I, I already res- respected him as a man and a man of God and somebody who I knew had a, a very humble heart that just wanted answers in whatever it was that he touched. And I... That was inspiring to me and, and attractive to me as a person going, I'm looking for answers for whatever reason. Every time I turned around, here's this guy popping up that was um, really easy to listen to and can break things down in a way that not too many people can without coming off as having this big head. And it wasn't long after we started working on Seed or we kind of finished some project on Seed that... It was one day we were just talking, and he asked me, he said, have you um, seen any of this flat earth stuff on Facebook or social media or anything? I'm like, yeah. And I've told this story before, so for those of you that heard it, sorry, I'm going to repeat it. But I said, yeah. I, I said, yeah, I have seen that. And I, and I, uh, I didn't laugh, but I went, yeah. And I go, um, but, you know, I go, why? Is there something to it or something? And Rob went, well... And it was that pause and the way he said it, just like that, that. I could see it. You know, I could just hear it, but I could see it. Well, and I went, well, tell me, what, what, are, what are you talking about? And he basically had told me about hearing Mark Sargent's Flat Earth Clues. And basically it was like the next day. Wasn't it like tax day or something or the day before tax day? Yeah. So I had a long road trip the next day. And I ended up listening to Mark's Flat Earth Clues because of Rob. And it wasn't long after that when Rob and I started kind of saying, well, what if we did this? What if we did this? And I told Rob, I'm like, I could see Chicago across Lake Michigan as a kid. I could see it. Depends on the weather, but you could see it. Rob was like, no way. I'm like, you got to come up here. And we started talking about how could we do this? And the more we talked about it, I'm like, we could do a boat, man. Just charter a boat and go. And you're like, oh, my gosh. I'm like, put a camera on it. Let's do it. And Rob was like, we could do this. So Rob went out and got the P900. I think he went out after that. And he was taking pictures of the sun. But it took us a long time to finally get this done. But I can thank him. At the same time, I want to kick him. Because my, my life did change. But in the, in the best way possible. Because, like I said earlier, the truth will set you free. But since that happened, we went from working on a science fiction project. I've been able to go on, across the lake with him. And test and prove that it's not a mirage. And balloon chasing. And we went balloon chasing. And the balloon chasing thing, you know, that spawned Mike Cavanaugh and a couple other guys reaching out, which Jaron and Bob and uh, Iru and, you know, there's so many people that, that now are involved with FE Core. Uh, but Cavanaugh and the original guy, Sandor and, and uh, Steve and Zach, just the, the whole group and Karen. What I can tell you is without Rob inspiring a lot of people, I don't think a lot of us would be here. You know, not taking anything away from anybody else. But from my standpoint with Rob, there's a, there's a special bond there. And I, uh, it's, it's an honor to be up on the stage with everybody that's on this panel. It's an honor to be here with all of you. Because like I said earlier, I truly believe that it's, a, it's an awakening process that none of us saw coming. And once again, I just want to th- say thank you, Rob. At the same time, I want to headlock you. But... <laughs> Thank you so much for your work, and you know I'm not speaking for everybody, but I know a lot of people here would have the same sentiment. Your work has really inspired all of us. So, and I don't just say that lightly. I mean that. Right? So, Thank you. 
Give it up for Mr. Rob Skiba. There you go. Thank that's, you. That's the man. All right. We're going to need to get my slides up on there because I'm going to be rapid fire through them probably through the whole presentation. Uh, well, first of all, welcome and thank you. Uh, thank you guys for your love, in many cases your prayers, your support. It's been cool meeting a number of you. I haven't met everybody yet. Maybe I will throughout the, the next day or so. But it's been really cool meeting you guys out there and getting the chance to talk with you. Uh, I want to talk briefly with the skeptics in the room and anybody in media that might still be here. Kind of bummed out that the, the big cameras left a while ago. They should have been here for the last presentation, shouldn't they? There was a whole lot of information that they missed out on. And, you know, let me just say, mocking is easy, okay? Anybody can send a monkey into a room with a camera and get them to videotape something stupid or interview somebody and take the most ridiculous 10 seconds of a 30-minute interview and put that into a little video with goofy music and make another hit piece. Anybody can do that. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dare you to try a little bit harder. Anybody who's still here in the media, try just a little bit harder. Uh, you might want to check out the ABC Nightline because the, the video that they did for the Flat Earth International Conference, the first one in Raleigh, it was probably the best one I've seen so far. Most of them put the goofy music, put people that look weird and people saying weird things, and then they just laugh and mock that this bunch of crazy flat earthers are meeting you know, in Edmonton this weekend. Try just a little bit harder. And remember this. There is a principle which is a bar against all information, which is a proof against all argument, and which cannot fail to keep a man in everlasting ignorance. That principle is condemnation before investigation. Now, that quote has been modified and used by various other people. Einstein apparently has a, a, a variation of that quote, but it's a very, um, it's a good quote to consider. If you're going to condemn without investigating, all you're going to prove is how high up on the mountain of ignorance you've decided to plant your flag. Right? And the rest of us are going to know. This, if you want to call it a movement, is growing exponentially worldwide. And there's a reason for that. Because people are starting to go out and do the investigation. Uh, Aristotle said, it is a mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. Allow yourself to take that step to just consider what's being said here this weekend. King Solomon said, he that answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly and a shame unto him. Now, I, like many others here, uh, come from a biblical worldview. And when it comes to starting your investigation, I'm going to say start here. <laughs> Genesis chapter 1, short chapter. Start there. You can go through the Bible, and you'll, you'll find that from Genesis to Revelation, it is a flat earth book. What's frustrating to me is that it seems to me that atheists are being more honest with the text than many theologians these days. That's unfortunate. Another interesting book you should check out is Zetetic Astronomy by Dr. Samuel Robotham, 1865. Follow that by 100 Proofs, Earth Not a Globe by William Carpenter, 1885. Terra Firma, Earth Not a Planet, Proved from Scripture, Reason, and Fact, David Wardlaw Scott, 1901. This is a more recent book by Edward Hendry uh, that came out, I think, in 2015. I would say if you haven't at least taken the time to read those, then you haven't done anything at all. You haven't done any investigation. Start there. And I'm going to help you guys out here, those who are of the mindset that I can't wait to get back and write a hit piece or put out a, another video that makes flat earthers look stupid. I'm going to give you a little, this is a freebie, by the way, debunking flat earth 101, a few tips to help you, okay? Number one, never forget we used to be you. There's nothing you're going to say to us that we didn't already know and believe ourselves three years ago or less. We went through the same indoctrination you went through. We had the globe in the classroom since kindergarten. We had the same textbooks. We've watched the same movies, documentaries, TV shows, been to the same museums. And we all started out saying the same thing. This is stupid. This is crazy. This is ridiculous. Why are we even talking about this? This is the 21st century, for crying out loud. Okay, we used to be you. Number two. None of us belongs to the Flat Earth Society. Okay, so if the first thing you're of the mindset, let's go to flatearthsociety.org or net or com or whatever it is, don't do that. 
most of us, I can't speak for everybody, but I think most of us recognize that site as either controlled opposition or just a hoax or just, you know, a, a joke. None of us belong to the Flat Earth Society, so, so don't go running there for your information, which leads to the next one. No one believes the upward floating disk theory of gravity. And if you don't know what that is, I made a little animation for you. So if you put this in your video, okay, <laughs> I might have to commission about 200 people to go slap the stupid out of you. <laughs> Nobody believes that. That comes from the Flat Earth Society stupid website. But how many, you guys have seen the news reports. How many news reports put that in there? Flat Earthers believe the Earth is grappling. How many of you have seen that? Raise your hand. Right? Media, take note. Please don't do that. Uh, number four. You guys don't know anything more about gravity than we do. Yeah, we know what goes up comes back down. So do you. But you ask even your most, your smartest guys, and they'll say, well, yeah, we don't know what it is or how it works. You know, I mean, is it, does it have to do with density and buoyancy? Does it have to do with mass? Does it have to do with electrostatic magnetism? What is it? We don't know. And you don't know either. So stop pretending you do. You can't just insert the flat earth into the Copernican model of the universe. This is a funny little meme that goes around Facebook, right? Flat earthers be like, <laughs> no, we're not. We, we don't believe that. That's not what we believe. Like somebody said earlier, you gotta think outside the box, outside the ball, outside of Carl Sagan, because we've we had to trash most, if not all of that, and start over again. So it's a cute meme, but it doesn't represent what we believe. Number six, do at least some research into JPL, NASA, Freemasons, Nazis, etc. Please, just just a little bit. Google helps. Number seven, learn for crying out loud, learn what a fisheye lens is and what it does to images. Please. I can't tell you how many people sent me pictures, uh, which I'll show you in a few minutes here, some of the ones that people sent, as proof that it's clearly fisheye lens. Number eight, uh, you don't have a working map either, <laughs> or a model, for that matter. You'll have mainstream physicists saying, we are 96% stupid when it comes to our understanding of the cosmos. We are off by 10, followed by 120 zeros. So you guys don't have a working model either. And when it comes to maps, you've had, what, 2,500 years? You guys say it goes all the way back to Pythagoras. You've had 2,500 years to get a map right. So to expect us to have a perfect model and a perfect map in three years with no money is an unrealistic expectation. Everybody's demanding, show us the map, show us the model, blah, blah, blah. We're like, you have $51 million a day and 2,500 years, and you don't have a working model and map yet either. So we're calling you out on that. Uh, relax, no one's falling off the edge. <laughs> you don't have to worry about that. We don't believe that either. Most of your typical top X reasons uh, videos that you guys put out are easy to debunk. You see those videos? Top 10 reasons why we know the Earth's a globe. Right, and they'll have stuff like, well, you can draw a 90-degree triangle on a ball. That proves the Earth's a globe. Proves you control on a ball. <laughs> that doesn't prove anything. You know, I went through some of those videos, and eight of them I was immediately, even before I even considered believing this stuff, eight of the ten were very easy to debunk. The other two took a little longer to figure out, but most of the videos you guys put out are pretty lame. Number 11, please try to keep up with the rest of the class. <laughs> we're not going to do your homework for you. Okay, I've got... Like, oh, Something like 163 videos out there, and most of them are between an hour and three hours long. <laughs> you know, you come to us with all these questions. Well, how does this work? How does that work? Chances are somebody's made a video about it. Do your own homework uh, before you start attacking us. Number 12, this is for Christians in particular. The Bible is a flat earth book from cover to cover, and we will go through that tomorrow. All right, so that's a freebie for you. There's 12 bullet points for you guys to, if you have the mindset of debunking, make sure you at least pay attention to those. You can take a picture of the screen if you like to before we move on here. All right, some people say that they, um, they're they here because of my research, and that scares me a little bit sometimes because I, I feel the weight of that responsibility. But I'm going to pass it off here because I blame some other people who came before me. <laughs> One of them standing standing right back there by the clock, John Gabrielson. He comes up from Austin to Dallas, says, hey, let's go out to dinner. So, you know, I said, okay, so we go out to dinner. And we're sitting there having a nice dinner together. And he goes, so, uh, Rob, you ever wonder 
how does water bend? What are you talking about, water? Water doesn't bend. It finds its own level. He's like, yeah, think about that the next time you look at the Pacific Ocean on a globe. What? Oh, yeah, and by the way, how does the atmosphere stick to a ball floating in the vacuum of space? I don't know. Shut up and eat your burger. <laughs> you know, he was the one that started it for me. Started the gerbil, you know, running on the wheel there. Then I made the enormous mistake of listening to this guy on a Canary Cry radio show on April 13th. And many of you know the story. On April 15th, I had him on my show to talk about the stuff that he talked about on the other show. And I affectionately referred to that as the day Mark Sargent ruined my life, which unfortunately for me is not too far from the truth. Uh, it's been a, actually a very difficult road. Uh, exciting, there's been blessings along the way, but it's also been quite difficult uh, in many ways. But uh, when, if you listen to that interview, I very much subscribe to this idea right here. This, I think the guy's name was Neil Adams. It was the expanding globe model because I was really into hollow earth and all that kind of stuff. So I'd actually done a lot of research on Admiral Byrd even before all of this. And, you know, a child could look at see how uh, South America fits into Africa like a puzzle. This guy shows how it looks like they fit all the way around the globe. And he made, a, in my mind, a really compelling case for the expanding globe model. And that's the, that's the model that I very much believed in at the time when I was talking with Mark. Shortly after watching Mark's Flat Earth Clues, I stumbled across this guy's channel, uh, Eric Dubay. He had a ton of content, it seemed like. I was always catching him on some kind of radio show, and I'm like, man, this guy's like unbelievably articulate. And I, it was through him that I realized that he was actually reading from some of these books right here. That, it was through him that I found these books. The books I mentioned earlier, Zetetic Astronomy and uh, 100 Proofs, Earth's Not a Globe, and Terra Firma was largely through listening to him. Uh, and he still puts out some really cool content. Uh, and in the process of looking around and videos, I stumbled across this guy right here. Matthew Boylan had a, um, it was an interview that he was doing, talking about when he was working at NASA as an artist, a, a realistic art, uh, painter, right? And he, he has this whole presentation where, is it, is it a painting or is it a, you know, is it a picture? And along those lines, I started to think about that and, the, the thing that all of these photographs have in common is that they are all artwork. Now take a look at that, the top two especially. That, that's not a photograph of, of wine glasses and bottles of wine. That's a painting, photorealistic painting. The bottom four images are actually done by a friend of mine. Uh, the bottom left is none of those actually are sculptures. The, the bottom left is a painting of a sculpture, and the other ones are drawings. Okay. Now, yeah, I said the same thing, right? You look at that and you say, wow, and well, let's put it a little bit into perspective here. Which do you think is harder to paint? <laughs> yeah, I mean, just looking at the wine bottle ones or any of them, really, I'm like, you know, the ball earth right there pales in comparison artistically. You know, so I started to think about what this guy's talking about, you know, his stand-up routine. I'm going, I got to say, you know, he makes a compelling case. Well... They come right out and tell you, actually. I'm a visualization scientist. I basically try to come up with ways of explaining complex science stories through the visuals and developing artwork and illustrations that actually can help explain the science story to people. For decades, popular culture and shows like Star Trek inspired a generation of scientists by envisioning what space might look like. But Wait, what does space actually look like? Heart nebulas, celestial collisions, a bird's eye view of the Milky Way, astronomers are charting the outer reaches of the cosmos and bringing back jaw-dropping images from telescopes like Hubble and its infrared cousin Spitzer. If you look down at the bottom of that Milky Way image, you'll see these two words, artist concept. This sweeping image of the Orion Nebula actually looks like this. And the TRAPPIST-1 star system, the latest discovery of seven potentially habitable exoplanets that made national headlines, it's really only a box of gray and white pixels. You see, space art is part of NASA, and it has been since before we went to the moon. Just something to think about. And then I stumble across this crazy guy. <laughs> Jaron, 
he's out there with lasers and stuff and, and doing tests. I mean, he's the first guy that I, I, I ran across online that was actually going out there and doing tests. You know, he's got this laser and he does this four mile thing and it was through his work that I started to understand the eight inches per mile squared and you start seeing, you know, graphics like that. And I start thinking about the math and how the ball is supposed to work and I'm going, wait a minute. You know, it's eight, in, eight, eight inches per mile squared. So if I'm six feet tall and you're six feet tall and you go three miles away from me, right? Three times three is nine times eight, 72, that's six feet. That means your feet should be six feet below my feet as you're going over the ball. If your feet are six feet below my feet, that means the top of your head is even with the bottom of my feet. So how am I seeing the horizon at my eye level? <laughs> like, these are the early questions that I started thinking about. And so I blame those guys. It's their fault, so you can blame them too. Taking a trip down the rabbit hole looks different probably for all of us. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my journey for the rest of this presentation. Uh, before getting into flat earth, I had spent a lot of time realizing that we live in a sea of lies. I had already been on the international public speaking circuit. I had published a few um, Amazon best-selling books uh, dealing with government conspiracies and subjects like the Nephilim, giants, hybrids, and things of that nature. And in the course of doing that research, I, I got almost to the point where they have lied to us about just about everything. So I, I kind of think I had to go on that journey before going on this one because I was already primed for it. When this one came across my plate, I'm going, well, <laughs> why not, you know? Uh, we've been lied to about so many other things. And I appreciate something that Robbie Davidson said to me once. He says, you know, I, he realized that when you start talking to other people and start trying to you know, bring the subject up, you really got to see where they are with at least two other subjects, 9-11 and the moon landings. If they still believe the official story about either one of them, talk about sports, walk away, <laughs> so whatever, you don't need to go any further. Uh, and along those lines, I would say there, here are a few documentaries, if you're not familiar with this, uh, that I highly recommend you check out. Loose Change, 9-11 in Plain Sight, and 9-11 Mysteries. There, there are, of course, many others that if you watch these on YouTube, you'll, they'll start to populate. But, yeah, you, we, okay, it's 2018. Um, it's time we really understand what happened on 9-11. And once you do understand what happened on 9-11, you quickly realize, oh, well, first of all, let me just ask you. Well, this is kind of unfair in this audience, but I would say, how many of you trust the government? <laughs> yeah. So maybe this is more for the Internet audience. Right? <laughs> Think about it, right? Yeah, if you're trusting your government as a source for truth, in spite of all the lies we know the government represents, I mean, come on, seriously? But when you start to understand the depravity, the depth of sadistic evil, when you start looking at things like this, yeah, you'll start looking at the government a whole lot different. And also with the moon landings. Because, I mean, in both cases, really, it was something that affected the world, didn't it? These, both of these events. Um, I was a hardcore believer in the moon landings until fairly recently. I, I didn't want to let that one go. I wanted to believe that. I was a NASA fanboy. Had a picture that was signed by uh, Jim Irwin that said, Reach for your dreams, Rob, aim high, supposedly with him on the moon. And he signed it for me. You know, that was my ambition was to be an astronaut. I didn't want to go down this path. But here's a couple of uh, documentaries you should check out if it's new for you. A funny thing happened on the way to the moon and astronauts gone wild, both by Bart Sabrell. Excellent. There are plenty of other ones out there also. Uh, the one on the, on the right there, is it's not a documentary, it's sort of a mockumentary in, in a way. Uh, it's a movie designed to show how they may have done it. And it's shot very much like it, as if it was a news crew was filming behind the scenes of what was going on in NASA in black and white and whatnot and, and how it all came to be. And, but there was something really interesting in that uh, video where they were saying, well, how are we going to pull this off? How are we possibly going to fool the whole world? And one of the characters says something to the effect of, we don't have to fool everybody. We just have to fool Walter Cronkite. <laughs> because if he believes it, everybody else will believe it. That's the power of media, right? So if this trusted source for your news is on TV and he's fully embracing this whole thing, his passion, his zeal, every, his excitement, that's what's going to sell everybody else. I'm like, wow, oh, bingo. Right there. Other thing that's interesting is in the picture there, they show the earth as like being pasted on the background, which I'll show you some more uh, shortly, that is true. A website you need to check out is AULIS.com. 
you need to spend about a week here at least. PhD, high-level uh, investigators going through, like, forensic evidence, looking at the photographic evidence and whatnot, and showing there's a lot of things that definitely seem to expose the Apollo program as fraudulent. This one especially. Uh, this picture here, I believe this is supposed to be Buzz Aldrin coming down the stairs there. And if you adjust, uh, they didn't count on Photoshop <laughs> in 1969. But you can bring it into Photoshop and adjust the contrast and the levels, and you start seeing pasted earths on the background, like this. Now, what's interesting is that picture, you mostly see that picture now cropped just to the right of that little square on the side, you know, where it turns blue. Uh, and they had, did you guys see that uh, video that was done by NVIDIA, the guys that make uh, video cards? They... Attempt Because they're looking at this and going, well, he's in the shadow. The, the light is on the other side. So if he's in the shadow part of the lander, how come he's so well illuminated? And so that's been one of the things that the, the debunkers have been saying, look, you know, this shouldn't be, this is stage lighting. So they were saying, well, what if we took all of the variables with the ground and the reflectivity of the suits and, and modeled all that in a 3D environment and see if we can recreate that? So they went through this long process of trying to figure out how they could create a 3D uh, rendering of that that would look the same. And that's the source of where a lot of the conspiracy theories come from, because when you look at that scene, Buzz Aldrin is completely in shadow because he's on the shadowed side of the lamp. The way that we normally think about light is that it comes from a light source, it hits a surface, and then it reflects toward a camera. But actually, light's more complicated than that because it doesn't just bounce straight to a camera, it also bounces and hits other parts of the scene. These inter-reflections make up a lot of the illumination content. The next step is basically adding additional point lights to simulate light bounced off of surfaces. The next step is basically adding additional point lights to simulate light bounced off of surfaces, and that just has to be placed by a human. And so if we enable that mode, you can see that it doesn't look very realistic at all. The next mode uses Maxwell's new rendering operations to render a more accurate view that actually does take into account spectral reflections, um, bounce light off the ground. But even after the light was modeled using NVIDIA's voxel-based global illumination, the image still did not look right. Part of the challenge was we've got to get the surface reflection of the moon dust, we've got to get the reflection off of the lunar module. We got all of that in place and properly modeled, we thought, but the image still didn't look quite right. There was some additional light source that was just missing. Turns out we found a clip of videotape that was shot from the other side of the ladder, and as he's coming down the ladder, from the opposite side, there is a huge glowing bright white light. And as we analyzed that video a little more, we realized it's Neil Armstrong himself. The bright white space suit that he was wearing reflected all that sunlight off of him and back onto Buzz Aldrin. So essentially, Neil Armstrong himself was a light source in that scene. It makes sense when you look at you know, the albedo value, which is the amount of light that's reflected into your eye, basically, from a surface. For the lunar soil, is around like 12%, but the, the suits, because they're like a, a Teflon-coated material, they're around 80 to 90%, and so they're very reflective. It's almost like a mirror, except you can't see something in the reflection, it just reflects the light. Once we pulled that information in and actually modeled an, a second astronaut and the light coming off of him, the bounced light was correct, and Buzz Aldrin looked lit properly as it did in that very famous photo taken in 1969. I could have saved them a lot of time and money and just said, look, uncrop the picture. <laughs> look at the stuff on the left, right? Um, there are other pictures like these right here where the backgrounds are the same with different shots. Well, the lunar lander didn't have the power, to, the ability to, to relocate, but you have different shots with the same mountain ranges superimposed. They look the same. You could adjust the uh, levels. You get little boxes around them. Uh, you see pictures like this with Buzz Aldrin, and I don't know who the other guy is there. Note the mountain range behind him, and then look at the, right below that, and Buzz hopping along, <laughs> allegedly on the moon. Yeah, it's probably all just a coincidence, right? Perhaps that's the reason why these guys started out looking like the picture on top and ended up looking like the picture on the bottom. If you've ever seen the interview with these guys, the press conference... They don't look like three guys that just got back from the moon. Not at all. Well, if the Apollo program didn't happen, then neither did this. Because that's Apollo 17. So, you know, these are the early stages for me of just kind of looking into things. And, of course, at that point, you start questioning everything. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video presentation. If you did... 
please subscribe to my YouTube channel, like the video, and share it on your favorite social media sites. There's a lot more to come, so stay tuned, and we'll see you back next time.